with youth in this church and in our records that talk about how powerful the youth are. And Joan of Arc was no different. She's 12, she starts to see these voices, she goes to church, she's a good girl. By the time she's 16, they get insistent and they tell her what her mission is. And her mission is to go and get the king, get the Dauphin crowned so that she can save France. Well, if we had more time, we could go on and tell you the miracles that take her to this place. But long story short, she goes to the king where he's at. Well, first of all, I have to tell you, her father said to her brother, if Joan goes after the army and into the military, I want you to kill her. Now that sounds harsh, but it's important to remember that whenever a girl followed the military at that point in time, she probably was a prostitute. Not necessarily the most moral character, and her father would rather have her dead and intact with her, more, with her virginity than as a prostitute. Luckily, that doesn't happen. Her voices actually are very insistent to tell her that she is to be the maid of France, which means that she is to stay pure. She is not to have relations with a man until God sees fit or her words, which apparently he never did. Not in her lifetime. She's burned at the stake by the time she's 19. She goes to meet the king, finally gets permission, gets a group of men who will escort her to see the king. The king hears of her plays a little trick on her, and he goes and he hides down in the courtiers, and he sends a guy up in front to pretend he's the king. She walks in, looks around, walks right up to the king out in the group and said, I'm here to crown you, God has sent me. At which point he looks at her, shocked that he knew she, that she knew who he was, because you know, they didn't have television, magazines, no email, right? And uh, it says, the records say that she gave him a sign. And because of that sign, he trusted her and knew that her words were right. Now, we don't know what the sign is. Records, uh, people think that perhaps it's because she tells him of a prayer that he said a few years earlier, Charles the Dauphin, when he recognized that this was such a difficult time for his people, that he is, goes to a church and he prays. And he basically says a prayer, something to the effect of, I do not know what my people have done, but whatever it is, Take me and save them. We don't know that that's what she actually said to him, but that was a prayer that he only prayed that only God knew of. Whatever it was, whatever she said to Charles helped him to recognize that she was sent of God. He takes three weeks to have her questioned by all of the clergymen and make sure that she's, you know, not, and she can answer every question put to her better than those who ask it. At which point he allows her to raise an army. They make an armor, suit of armor for her. She's never ridden a horse. Well, at this point she had, but she wasn't experienced in it. She had never fought. She didn't know how to handle a sword, but they make her a suit of armor specifically for her, which is very important because she has to wear this suit of armor. It has between 12 and 22 straps to keep it on, which not only is to protect her in the military, but is to protect her virtue. She also cuts her hair, which is important because now she looks like a man. That's going to come back in a minute. They give her a sword. She's like, oh, that sword's too heavy. Can't do it. Can't do it. My St. Catherine, well, I should tell you who talks to her. St. Catherine, St. Margaret, Michael the Archangel, Gabriel comes, and then she has times where she sees concourses of angels, all for her, all for Joan. Catherine, St. Catherine says to her, I have a sword. It's over in this church underneath the altar. Go dig it up and find it. And of course they do. And there's this sword that is her. But she doesn't carry the sword into battle very often. She would rather carry her banner, which was the fleur de lis, and, talked, and had a reference to God the Father and the Son, because she didn't want to kill anybody. So she didn't carry her sword unless she absolutely had to. But if she did, it was a sword that she could handle. So she ends up getting the king to Rims, where he had to be crowned, and there are miracles of that. Pretty soon her voices tell her, number one, they tell her that she's going to be wounded, and she's wounded in the exact same way that they tell her she will be, but she's not killed. They also tell her when she will be captured. She's captured right before Midsummer Day in, mm, she's the year she's 18. Anyway, she's captured by the Burgundians, who are British allies, but they're also on the French, on the French side. And at that time, you could um, ransom your prisoners. Well, no way is England going to ransom her. The Burgundians pay high price for her to be sold to the English so she could go and be put under trial. Um, and the English were not about to let her go. 
Not only that, King Charles, he really didn't have any money and he didn't make any effort to raise money to uh, get her home. She goes and she's put in to the court system in England. The problem is she's a woman, and women were supposed to be guarded by nuns, especially because the charges were, well, let's just say, if you hear voices and you see visions at that point in time, you're charged with being a witch. Sorry about that. Hope that doesn't bother any of us, right? Not only that, because she's wearing men's clothing, and she is fighting as a man, taking communion as a man. Oh, I forgot to tell you the rest of the stuff she does to her army. I have to come back to that. That's going to be important. She takes communion as a man, and she basically leads her army as a man, which the church court in England said, because she was dressed as a man, it is an offense to God. And they, it was heresy, basically, because cross-dressing was kind of against the church rules. But that church was a little bit more honoring. Apparently you get burned at the stake for that. Can I jump back to her army for a minute? This is going to be important. Because remember I said any woman who followed the army was usually not very of high quality. Once the king gives her permission to gather an army, she does so. And the first thing that she does is she kicks out all the prostitutes. And one record says she does it by sword point. Now, I don't know about you. She's not very old. She can't be very big, but she's got to be feisty, don't you think? She kicks all the prostitutes out. You can only stay in the army, following the army, if you are married to someone in the army who is fighting, and then you can cook and clean for him. Now, isn't that a great thing we girls get to do sometimes, following the <laughs> You might want to look at the National Defense Authorization Act they just passed yesterday, which now makes it so that all the girls have to sign up for the, for the uh, civil service for the draft. Enough said about that. Never we're smiling. She also talks to her gentlemen. She calls them God's army. She does not allow swearing, smoking, drinking, gambling, and she makes them go to church. That just makes me giggle. Out to the prostitutes, and you better go repent. Let's go to church today. Okay, but that's what that was her military code of conduct, and that becomes important when we get down into modern um, America times. Okay, so where was I? She was getting in trouble. Oh, cross-dressing and witch, right? They charged her. They said, because you're wearing a man, you're a heretic. Because being a heretic is knowingly going against anything the church doctrine is. That's a heretic. And she says, well, you know what? If you'd let me be guarded by the nuns, I would go back to wearing a dress. And they said, no, nope, but wear a dress anyway. Because what's the punishment for being a heretic? Being burned at the stake. And she did not want to be burned. So she said, okay, give me a dress. Guess what? She gets a dress. For two days, she has to fight off attackers. She finally puts her armor and her, sword, her suit of armor back on, laces it all up, and says, I don't think so. At which point they said, oh, not only are you a heretic, but now you're a relapsed heretic. At that point, they realize that they have got her, and that's why she's burned at the stake. Not because she went and fought. Not because she was doing angels and saw visions because she dressed like a man. They burned her at the stake. You can see that in 1431. And as she is dying, actually the first thing that she says is, as she's recognizing and they read the charges to her as she's roped to the stake, she breaks down and cries and she says, I forgive you. I forgive you for killing her, basically. And she says, please will someone, she wanted someone to have a cross so she could look at the cross as she died. And one of the guards, actually at this point they're all in tears, well wouldn't you be? And one of the guards fashions her a cross out of wood and he gives it to her and she's able to hold it. And the whole time she's dying, she's crying, Jesus, Jesus, save me. Have mercy on me. I prayed that I wouldn't cry. Apparently my prayers are not answered today. That one anyway. She dies. 1431. A martyr. They burn her so that she can't be buried, so that no one can go and give homage at her grave, so that she can't be an official martyr. Well, this is a problem, because think of the king. If you're the king of France, and the person responsible to put you on the throne is a witch and a heretic, what does that mean for you as the king? You're on tenuous ground. So, 1455, he goes to the church and he says, uh, the war ends. 
France wins, or England leaves France. 1455, the, Charles comes to the uh, church leaders throughout the time, and he said, um, I need to have, can we please reopen the trial and relook at this? So they start the rehabilitation process, which would have opened up her trial records. The reason that we know so much, and Mark Twain, his book is kind of thick, the reason we know so much is because all of the records for all of the trials and everything that she went through, every word that she said was recorded. And they're still in uh, the Catholic Church's um, archives today, and Mark Twain was able to go, and that's where he got this information from. That's how we know the things that happened specifically about her and the words that she says. She's rehabilitated about 1455, which means the trial is reopened. She's beatified in 1909 and actually made a saint and canonized as a saint in 1920. So her life from 1412 to 1900, that's a 500, I mean, that's a big, long time span for her name to be out there. Well, 1455, look who's born in 1451. Four years after Christopher Columbus is born, they start her trial, they reopen it, and it takes a while for it to get to where she can go through and have any recognition. And they go through all of the trial hearing voices, having visions, and doing these things. Christopher Columbus, he's born in 1451 in Genoa, Italy. France goes to Spain, but this would have been happening and he would have known. Now, if you're someone who, I don't know, perhaps has visions or hears voices, as Christopher Columbus later said that he did, and even Orson Hyde in the Journal of Discourses talks about the angel who appeared to Christopher Columbus. If you know that somebody gets burned at the stake for doing that, would you say anything? I probably wouldn't. <laughs> he doesn't. But you know the story of Christopher Columbus. The struggle that he has and the problems that he has to face to be able to get to America. But he talks about it and he actually he writes a book. Christopher Columbus is a very pious man. Very pious, very humble. By the time he's 30, he's gray because of all the struggles that he's gone through. Um, he recognized that God had a special purpose for him. In fact, this is what he says to King Ferdinand of Spain. He said, The Lord was well disposed to my desire, and he gave me courage and understanding. He unlocked my mind, sent me upon the sea, and gave me fire for the deed. Those who heard of my enterprise called it foolish, mocked me, and laughed. But who can doubt that the Holy Spirit inspired me? He felt that he had a divine mission to find other sheep of the fold, which were on the isles of the sea. So much so that he studied the Bible. And he goes through and compiles a book of prophecy, kind of a little thick book, the book of prophecy, which dealt with every prophecy he could find in the Bible that dealt with um, anything to happen in the last days before Christ could come again. And then he underlined those that he felt specifically dealt with him fulfilling the prophecy. He knew that he would find a pure, white, wholesome people. And the records show that when he landed in America, that there were tribes of white people the same as you and I. They since died out because of the disease that we brought, that Christopher and his people brought them. But today, you would not hear Christopher Columbus being touted as someone who wanted to bring Christianity to the world. But that was what he wanted to do. His patron saint was Cristobal, was Cristobal, that's why he's called Cristobal Colon, and he's known as the Christ Bearer. That's what he felt his mission was, was to take Christ and Christ's doctrine to the rest of the world, and that's what he did. So much so that when he does get his boats, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, usually when the king or queen bequeaths upon you a boat, and they um, give you the people to man it, you know, the sailors, they're usually people from... The prisons, because it's easy to watch people on a boat. They can't really escape. <laughs> They're shucks. I don't know. <laughs> Christopher Columbus said, no. The people who will be on my boats will be Christians. And we will pray every day. They will go to church. And whatever they gain, meaning if they find gold, whatever riches they gain, they will pay a tithe on. He was very insistent on that. Not only that, he knew the people that he was going to go find. He was not going to find a trade route to India. He was going to find other lost sheep. And one of the ways that we can prove that is he recognized that they would be speaking Hebrew, or that's what he thought. And he found a Hebrew interpreter, someone who understood that because he thought that's the language that he would find once he found the land that he found. 
We know more about Christopher Columbus, but we're running out of time. Needless to say, he's also mentioned in Nephi. He dies in 1506. A hundred years later, Jamestown is settled, which is the first English charter of our country. Now, it's important to remember the Jaredites had the covenant, the Nephites had the covenant, Nephites didn't hold it, Jaredites didn't hold it, and God said in 1 Nephi, he talks about anyone who comes to this land will come because I bring them and because they promise to keep the covenant. 1607, you have the first American settlers. 1620 is when the pilgrims come, and we know that they bring the Bible with them. Which it's interesting to me that it's 1611 when the King James Bible gets translated. You know, if you want a fantastic little read, not a read, a fun night, BYU did a great um, documentary on Joan of Arc, one on Joan of Arc, and one on the King James Bible. And they're really kind of fun. They give you a little bit more background, more document, or uh, uh information and what we have time to go through today. But by 1620, here come the Mayflower and the pilgrims on it. And what did they come for? They came for religious freedom, meaning that they were willing to show God that we will keep the covenant, and the covenant becomes reinstated with them. It's interesting because then a hundred years later, you have those who God tells us in the Doctrine and Covenants, wise men that I have raised up for this very purpose, which means the Constitution in this life, you have them starting to come upon the scene. 1706, Benjamin Franklin. Wait, i got to make sure I'm not making a mess here. 1706, Benjamin Franklin. 1732, George Washington. 1743, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and you can see that they start coming on the scene. It's important to remember 1755. It's not on your paper, but it's important to remember that 1755 is the Frank, uh, French and Indian War. Sometimes my brain has to find the proper file. The French and Indian War, where again, France and England are fighting. At this point, George Washington actually fights for the king, and he's on a horse. And everybody who is a leader of the king's army at that point is on a horse. And they're fighting against the French and the Indians. The Indians know that all they have to do is take down the guys on the horses. And how hard would it be? You're wearing red and those white crosses. You're like a bullseye. And they are good shots, especially the Iroquois. They are very good shots. In fact, the command is given by one of the Indian chiefs to aim true and only aim for Washington. Not one of them hit him. And it's not because they weren't good shots. In fact, the same Indian chief years later comes to Washington before he's president and says, I want to shake my hand, to shake the hand of the man that I could not kill that day. And I, he recognized, he goes on to tell Washington, it's called the Bulletproof George Washington, if you're interested. He goes on to say, all of my braves knew not how to miss but for you. And he said, and at that point I told them to quit firing because I knew that God's hand was over you. And he goes on to prophesy this Indian chief, and he says, you will become the father of a great nation. This is 1755. He's still English, George Washington. But at this point, he's written his rules of civility. He is a very pious, he's very humble, he's a very peaceful man. And I can't think of anyone better than George Washington that could be called the father of our country because of the wonderful things that he does. Um... Once we have everybody on the scene, all of the early founders, the Madisons, the John Jay, the Roger Sherman, all of these people, once we have them on, then things start to really heat up. Because God wants to set this covenant of the land, and he can't do it without freedom. He can't do it without freedom, and if we're still under a king. Now, you have to remember, at this point in time, right before the Revolutionary War, we are English. In fact, has anybody been to Williamsburg, Virginia before? Okay, so it's like Nauvoo on steroids, right? Well, it's fantastic. You could spend the two days there. I highly recommend it. But you go to Williamsburg, Virginia, and there's these little places. You go into the houses. It's like Nauvoo where you go in and they tell you the stories. Well, there was one extra little thing. But you should go to Mount Vernon, too. I did. Well, we don't have time for Mount Vernon, Monticello, Jamestown. Been there, done that, loved it. Okay, but there was one little extra activity one night that said, come sing patriotic songs. And I thought, Oh, I was telling my husband and I said, oh, I want to go sing patriotic songs. I like to sing patriotic songs. And we walked in. We sat down in the front row because I'm a front row girl, right? And they start singing God Save the King. And I must have registered on my face like... And the gentleman looks at me and he says, well, what would you think we'd be singing, madam? Oh, because Williamsburg, Virginia is set up 
as an English colony right before the Revolutionary War. It's so great. They have the House of Burgess that's there where, the, where they actually, every other day probably, they read the Declaration of Independence. Oh my goodness, if you want a special, it's a powerful experience. I highly recommend it. Anyway, why was I telling you about Williamsburg? English? I don't remember. We'll move on. What did you say? We're still English. We're still English. That's the point. We are still English. And then we come to the Boston Massacre, the Boston Tea Party, and the First Continental Congress. The Boston Tea Party, if we had time, we'd... Oh my goodness, we don't have time. If we had time, we'd talk about how the Boston Tea Party really was a problem for us in America. Oh, that's what I was going to say. At this point, we're English, which means about three million people right before the Revolutionary War are living here. One in four Englishmen lives here in the, in the colonies. One in four. This is important, and the average age is about 15, except for Benjamin Franklin, because he's, you know, the oldest guy. Smartest, but the oldest. <laughs> and um, so, but of the three million people, by the time we get to the Revolutionary War, only about 3% three per, three fight on the side of George Washington. 3% of the 3 million fight against George Washington, and you want to know what the rest do? They say, let George take care of it. And they don't get involved. And if they do, it's only to make money usually. Okay, so, we don't have time to talk about the First Continental Congress that was uh, organized in response to the king's uh, punishment on the colonies from the Boston Tea Party. But we do want to talk a little bit about the shot heard around the world, which is the first battle, the Lexington and Concord battle. It's Paul Revere's ride. This is the first battle of the Revolutionary War. If you look in the Bible dictionary under covenant, you will find that a covenant is never made without the shedding of blood. This is where the covenant gets restarted with our people, with the American people, the American colonists, and it's done with blood. Um, this is important because the founders from 1607, when they come to Jamestown, those first colonists, they and the colonists clear up until Washington's time, they considered themselves, they recognized that this was a promised land. They called themselves New Israel, New Jerusalem, and they felt that they were supposed to be a city set on a hill for freedom that would go throughout all of the world. So this covenant gets reset. In fact, President Benson talks about how this covenant is... Uh, uh, made with the blood of patriots. And he talks about how that reinstates the, cover, uh, the covenant. And George Washington is the leader of the army. Um, the shot heard around the world, Lexington and Concord, which of course leads to the Declaration of Independence, the 56 signers. If we had time, we would read President Benson's talk where he talked about what happened to the 56 signers because they sacrificed their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. A number of them died, they lost their fortune, but it's interesting to note that the 56 signers, they signed 312 children. That's 312 deep patriots with patriot blood, right? This is the covenant being um, perpetuated with the next generation. 1776 comes, they sign the Declaration of Independence, but nothing happens. The Americans cannot win. George Washington, the first part of the army, he's really good at retreating. He just retreats, 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 and it's to save his army. Do you know when they organized an army, when they conscripted the army during the Continental, Con or the Continental um, uh, Army, that's the word I'm looking for, their, their enlistments were only for about six months. At the end of six months, they would have to re-sign up again. Not only that, but the battle was fought. Most of, the, most of those who fought in the battle were fighting roughly about 50 miles away from home. Would you like to know that, uh, let's see if I can find it, the war casualties from the Revolutionary War, about 4,000 people died in battle. 10,000 people died on British warships, but 60,000 died from hunger, fatigue, exposure, and neglect of Congress. 60,000. It's difficult to comprehend what George Washington would have had to have gone through, because every six months when they didn't win something, everybody would melt back into the wilderness and go home, because it's warm there and there's food, right? Oh, I, got a, I told you it would come in handy. George Washington became the leader, and do you know what he did? Because he had studied Joan Mark. He instituted Washington's military code of conduct, which, guess what, was based on Joan Mark's no prostitutes, no smoking, drinking, gambling, no swearing, and you go to church. Because he recognized that that was God's army as well. Okay. 
They have to win something, and they're not. Nobody's coming to help them. Benjamin Franklin's in France saying, please come and help us. And they're saying, well, you guys can't fight it by yourself. What do you want us to do? Come and do it for you? No, I don't think so. And then we come to the Battle of Trenton, the fall of 1776. The Hessians are here. Why are the Hessians, the Germans, here fighting? Well, because one in four Englishmen is here. When the king in England says, let's go fight in America, guess what? It would have been you coming to fight your brothers, your uncles, your nieces, and nephews. This was a civil war, and they wanted none of it. So the king of England paid his cousins, who were the Germans, to come. That's where we get the Hessians. And they wore blue coats, which is important, because the English wore red, the Hessians wore blue. And it is said that when the Hessians, they were so fearful because they were paid. There was nothing about liberty and freedom. All they wanted was money, and they were brutal. It was said that when the Hessians rattled their sabers, the Continental Army would run. And they would because they were so brutal. Well, fall of 1776, George Washington recognizes that their enlistments are going to be on New Year's Day. And he knows this is a problem. They have to have something that will turn the war. He knows that the Hessians are in Trenton, New Jersey, and that they're settled down for a long winter's nap. They're not coming out to fight. And so he decides that he um, is going to do something about it. He has to do something about it. He comes, upon, he comes, uh, comes upon a plan where he says, you know, the Germans, they like to drink a lot. Christmas is coming. They like to drink a lot. And if Christmas is coming, which they celebrated for two days, they're going to be really drunk. 1,500 Hessians are in Trenton, New Jersey, and George Washington decides that that is when he's going to make his attack. He lines his men up, and he tells them what they need to do. There's about 2,400 Continental soldiers. They separate into three contingencies to cross the Delaware. Before he goes, he says to them, he reads, he says, um, Thomas Paine's American Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered. Yet we have this consolation with us that the heart of the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. What we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Tis dearness only that gives everything its value. Heaven knows how to set a proper price upon its goods, and it would be strange indeed if so celestial an article as freedom should not be highly rated. With that quote, with that speech by General Washington quoting Thomas Paine, they are each given three days' rations, one blanket, and 40 rounds of ammunition for the 2,400 soldiers who are going to go fight the 1,500 Hessians across the river. The password that night is victory or death. And it's about 11 o'clock at night. The goal is to capture them in the middle of the night. As they're crossing the Delaware, you've seen the picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware, which isn't accurate because there wasn't a flag at that point in time and other things. But they go to cross. Well, the two contingencies that are on the side, they get stopped and they can't cross. It reminds me of Gideon's army. You know when Gideon goes and the God says, you know, go and fight. And Gideon says, okay, I got this... 3,000 people, and the Lord says, okay, well now everybody who crosses over this line wants to go home, they can go home. Okay, and he loses about a third of his army. Then he says, everybody, go and get a drink. And if you drink like this, you go home, right? If you lap it like it, but if you bring it up like this, you stay. And Gideon's army is whittled from 3,000 down to 300, and they win. Why? Because God was fighting their battle. And he says to them, basically, right? You had to see that you couldn't do it and that you would trust me. Same thing happens to George Washington that night. The two contingencies on either side don't get across the river, and the weather starts in earnest. It's difficult for them to cross the river, but they do it. And the nice thing is it's so cold that it drives the Germans inside, and there are no pickets outside to warn them that they're coming. The next morning, the Germans wake up. I'm imagining they got a little bit of a head over, head hangover, a little, a little, they're probably, it's a doozy. And they wake up to find George Washington's cannons pointing down the street. 1,500 soldiers. Of the 1,500, the other 1,000 are either captured, cap captured or killed, and the other 500 escape. And not one of the Continental soldiers does. But they get the stores, right? They get what the Russian or what the Germans had. And that's where we get the title turncoat, because they went and got those blue coats. They were cold. They were given one blanket for crying out loud. They went and got the Germans' coats, but in order to not be shot by their own people, they had to turn them inside out so that you couldn't see the blue. That's where you get the term turncoat from. At that point, 
George Washington knows that the Hessians are going to get some more reinforcements and he's got to get his men back across the river, but no one dies. One, two people are injured, actually. One is the future president, James Monroe, but no one dies until they start coming back across the river and then four of them die due to exposure. They get back home, back to their quarters, and George Washington is recognizing this is a great win. And he says to his men, who his enlistments are now up the next day, and he says, you know what, I need you here. I need you to re-enlist, because if you don't re-enlist, then I'm going to have to take time to re-enlist, and then they'll come and we could be wiped out. This is a turning, this is a crisis point, and not one of the men re-enlists. So George Washington says this to them on the banks of the Delaware River. You are the soldiers of whom Thomas Paine wrote. You are not the summer soldiers who shrink in the trials of winter. You have so nobly suffered unbearable hardships and deprivations in silence and finally have risen in impossible conditions to defeat a powerful enemy. For these things I and your countrymen are indebted to you forever. Were it in my power, I would send you home, but I cannot. Our victory at Trenton will surely bring the wrath of the British Empire down upon us, and unless we meet them and somehow turn them, we will have lost all we have gained at such a terrible price. My brave fellows, you have done all that I have asked you to do, and more than could be reasonably expected. But your country is at stake, your wives, your houses, and all that you hold dear. You have worn yourselves out with fatigue and hardships, but we know not how to spare you. That's a moving speech from a man that they loved, and at that point, after those words, almost every available man re-enlisted. This is where Joan of Arc comes back in. Because the Battle of Trenton was so pivotal and changed the course of the American Revolution, they sent that information to Benjamin Franklin, who's in France, trying to get them to come to our aid. And as soon as Benjamin Franklin can say, we won Trenton, the French could see that we didn't do it, that they wouldn't have to do it themselves, and then they start sending their ships. They don't come for a year, which leads us to this picture. This is why France, this is why Joan is so important. If Joan of Arc would not have done what her angels and her voices told her to do, France would have lost. And who would have come to the aid of the American revolutionaries? Joan is the first great American. After this, the war goes on for four more, five more years before it's officially over, well, before it's unofficially over and Cornwallis uh, declares his defeat at Yorktown. And that's the virtual end of the Revolutionary War. But it's not for two more years until the Treaty of Paris is signed in September 3rd. At the end of that, um, George Washington's men come to him. They've had two years. The Congress is still not paying them. It's a difficult time. And George Washington hears in the rumor mill that his military army wants to make him the first king. George Washington, we love you. You are an honest, moral man. You are keeping God's covenant, and we want to make you king because Congress is not doing what they've promised they would do. Now, we can't blame them, right? Because if we were taught the same way they were taught, we'd be doing the same things that they were doing. They were doing the best that they knew how. But they, nobody ever learned. They didn't know how to run a country. They didn't know what they were doing. It was difficult. They didn't know how to not fight amongst themselves. And George Washington's military men recognized, number one, that they weren't getting paid. They weren't being taken care of. And they had fought for the freedom of this country. They had reinstituted the covenant upon this land. And George Washington hears about this plot to make him the king. And the governor, the military could have done it. At which point he goes and he talks to them all. And he basically says, uh-uh, not playing this game. Well, they don't listen to him because they are tired of being neglected. At which point he pulls out a letter that he wants to read to them from someone in Congress. And he pulls the letter out and his men look at him. And these are men that love him, that watched him, that saw him. And he looks at them, and he looks at this letter, and the men realize that he cannot read it. And he fumbles in his pockets, and he pulls out a pair of glasses that his men had never seen him wear, only his closest aides, and he puts them on. And he basically says, please excuse me, not only have I sacrificed my life, given my life in defense of my country, I have also given my eyesight. Which, of course, puts all the men in the room in tears like it does to me. And it's averted. We could have had the first king, George I. But George Washington understood the difference between freedom and liberty. He understood that choosing God's law meant choosing God. 
And he tells Congress a number of times during the war, he said no less than 56 times had the God of this land and the God of Providence protected us, the hand of Providence protected us, and this army. He knew what the covenant was about. It's fascinating because after the, trip, after the Treaty of Paris is signed, it takes another four years before they recognize that they need to have a formal declaration of what this country should be. And the Constitution doesn't get written until 1787. Not adopted until 1789, at which point then you can see they start to die. As soon as they are done doing what God needs them to do to establish the land, they start to pass on and the next group comes in. It might interest you to know that the Constitution is actually ratified on April 6th. April 6th of 1789, when George Washington is unanimously elected, the only president to ever be unanimously elected twice. And he's inaugurated on April 30th of that same year. Benjamin Franklin passes away 1790, merely a year later. And then George Washington dies nine years after that, at which point then those of the Restoration come onto the scene. Why? Because you must have freedom first before you can have freedom of religion. You must be able to choose first before you can choose God's law. Joseph, uh, Joseph Smith is born 1805, and I hope that you can go and you can see the scriptural references, um, because this is God's covenant, and he tells his prophets exactly what's going to happen. Some of us got it in hindsight, but Nephi got it in, in uh, beforehand, right? Joseph Smith is born, Abraham Lincoln shows up in 1809, and then Thomas Jefferson dies 1829, on the exact same day as John Adams, which is July 4th. But before he dies, before he dies, this is what he says, recognizing that this land is based on God's law. In 1820, this is what Thomas Jefferson writes in the letter to Jared Sparks. He says, If the freedom of religion guaranteed to us by law in theory can ever rise in practice under the overbearing inquisition of public opinion, Truth will prevail over fanaticism, and the genuine doctrines of Jesus will again be restored to their original purity. This reformation will advance with the other improvements of the human mind, but too late for me to witness it. He dies in 1829, and the church is organized in 1830. These are men who knew. Then think ahead to what happens in the... In the uh, Jordan River Temple. No, St. George Temple. It says Jordan something, George Jordan. In the St. George Temple, we have the founders who come, and they come to Wilfred Woodruff, and what do they say? Do my work. Please do our work. We sacrificed everything for the covenant of this land. At that point in time, there were actually four men who had their anointings to become uh, the Melchizedek priesthood holders. Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, Christopher Columbus, and John Wesley, who's the founder of the Methodist Church. Not only that, but there were women. Did you know they did Jane Austen that day? Okay, it probably took a couple weeks, but they did Jane Austen, Emily Bronte, George Washington's wife, and a lot of the other president's wives. There were a few that weren't done. I find it interesting, Tom, John Hancock was not done. And I thought, oh, how dare they? He's the one who signed the original, or the original declaration that went to the king. If anybody was going to get drawn and quartered, hung up, do you know what you do if you get... Can I tell you what happens if you're convicted of treason and then I'll be done? Okay, well, I'll wrap up. If you're convicted of treason, so if they would have lost the Revolutionary War, they would have... Uh, what do you do? See, I must be done. I'm losing my words. When you capture the people um, and then you uh, condemn them for treason, first of all, you hang them by the neck until they pass out. Then you cut them down, revive them, disembowel them, boil their organs in oil, and burn them and scatter them to the four winds so that no one can come to your grave and call you a martyr. The founders understood. Brothers and sisters, this covenant is with our land, and today it runs with us as well. And we only have to keep the commandments, and we will prosper in the land. We look at all of the things that are happening throughout the world today, especially in our country, the awful things that happened just this last weekend, and we, uh, we wring our hands and we say, what, what, what? Well, our founders gave us the answer, and it's right here. And guess what? It does not require blood. It can be done peacefully. If you understand the principles that they gave us in the Constitution, the covenant runs with the land, and God loves this land, and he loves his people, of which I hope that we can remember that we are his people. And this I say in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.